And that became the framework of what we found was that we have learned, in fact, from our colleagues at the University of San Francisco, that only 8% of the US population knows the document exists, yet it is supposed to be taught in high school in California. It's in the standards. Uh, in the 10th grade specifically, in 11th and 12th grade as well. Um, and yet, it, it isn't being learned in a way, if it is being taught, that, that actually saves these people. What we saw in the gifted work of Sarah Kroll, who you'll, you'll be meeting shortly, and Youth Speaks processes, it was the arts that made the difference. It was when young people had the opportunity to literally create a movement that reflected concepts like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, that this is how they actually grasped the meaning of otherwise abstract words. And when they had the opportunity to take their ideas and express them in their own creative vehicles, whether it was dance or song or rap or spoken word, that they had the opportunity to demonstrate a transformation of learning about what these concepts meant to them. And that is what we have, in a sense, formalized in the curriculum that we published in 2010 with the help of our pilot schools, Balboa and Royal High School, who are represented here today, to teach the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in social studies and language arts academic classes, but using the arts as an integral part of teaching where the arts are helping grasp the concepts and the vehicle for expressing ideas. So we have spent the last three days with an incredible group of about 24 people, teachers, we have seniors from a royal high school joining us as well. Um, we have teachers, we have students, we have some administrators, and we have some uh, organizational leaders who have been learning about, and we just started this on Monday, on Tuesday, excuse me, learning about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights Education, then grasping the grown experience of music, visual arts, and performance arts. And since yesterday afternoon, have been creating their own culminating presentations to pull together their ideas about what they've learned and incorporating some of their own personal experiences. And so what you're about to see are four different culminating presentations of these groups' wonderful processes of bringing together what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights means to them. Thank you for watching, and we'll, we'll reconvene after to just get your thoughts on what has happened. Thank you. So this is our same this is our third year on this floor. Um, my name is Sarah Cole and I'm the artistic director at Destiny Arts Center, which is a violence prevention and arts education agency based in Oakland. And we've been around for 25 years. I've been there for 24. It is absolutely thrilling for me to be with teachers and educators.
Sandy was describing as their day, we spent just the last couple days, really, this is our third day, so we were in bad rehearsal this morning. So this is, like I said, very ambitious for artistic endeavor, using music, voice, text, and theme, right? So the theme is universal decoration of human rights, and it's through the lens of our personal experience. So group number one, you love group number one. Is that, is that a knife? What should I do? Um, excuse me, um, do you just come outside, right, right, right outside the door with me for a second? Okay. All right. So I see, um, still not doing the do now. Yeah. You know you should, uh, do the do now. Okay. Okay, um, so is there a reason why you're not Doing the do now? We just not feeling it. Right? It's not. It's not. It's not feeling it. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, do you think maybe we could go back in there? I could sit down with you. I could talk you through the do now. I mean, I guess that could work. Okay. All right. Let's go back in. There. Oh wait, wait. And um, could you just give me the knife? Can you please promise to give back to me before I school? I need a protection. I promise. Um, and uh, just, just, just so I know, like, why do you uh, need this knife anyway? You never know what you're gonna run into on your walk home from school. Like, I feel so unsafe, even though it's just a few blocks down. Mm -hmm. Talk about, talk about this later. Article three: Everyone has the right to live, to be free, and to feel safe. I'm the president of the Tenants Association in public housing, and I walk into the main entrance lobby of my building, and I'm looking at the wall of mailboxes, and I see a KKK. I come a little closer to see whose mailbox is <coughs> my mailbox. I ask Now, in the last stream, or the life, 
their family and the government take care of them. I come from a place where education in all levels is free and accessible to every person. I come from a place where, where health care is free and accessible to everyone. And nobody dies in the streets or have injuries not healed because they don't have enough money, a private health insurance or documentation. I come from a place where after two world wars between sisterly countries, after a horrible civil war between brothers and sisters and a dictatorship for almost 40 years, we learned that every person has the right to live with dignity, with freedom, and with the basic needs, housing, food, healthcare, personal safety, love, and education. I come from a place where after many centuries of wars and hurt aches, we learn that we should learn from the past and we should learn from others to not repeat the same mistakes and to join forces to co-create a world in where each and every person can live with dignity. Judge by the way I look. I mean, 
Haven't you ever heard of the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover? Well, well, I hate that I get judged by the way I look. I mean, don't, by, don't judge a person by the way they dress. Why do I have to be acting like I'm, why do I have to be acting like I'm extra loud or extra American, right? Just so I can feel like I'm treated like a person. Why should I be, why shouldn't I be free to be who I am? Why should I have to act like something I'm not? I hate that I have to make these people feel like I'm something like I'm not good enough, right? I wish I had an identity. An identity? Try living every day of your life with people telling you who you should be. When I was little, my dad, all he wanted was for me to play soccer, you know, follow in his footsteps. But I hated soccer. I hated going to the park to kick around polyester stitching covered in synthetic leather. Polyester? Gross! When I got to kindergarten, all of the boys played with cars and dinosaurs, and they wanted to play basketball. I just wanted to play foursquare with the rest of the girls. And I just wanted to paint my nails, you know, with my mom and play with my cousin's Barbies. Look, so perfect. But you know, when I got to middle school, I got into my theater stage, and I just wanted to spend every hour on stage singing in choir. But I couldn't do so without people calling me a fat. What's so gay about singing? Like, have you heard of Frank Sinatra? And you know, when I got to high school, everyone's favorite time, I went to a Christian one. All I ever heard was people talking about how great God is, and you know, his love, and that to invite him into your heart, you just have to speak the words. But this book condemns me, and I hated that part of me, and I rejected that part of me, and I repressed it. And you know, to this day, now that I'm comfortable with who I am, I can't shake this feeling of conflict. I'm scared of where I'm going to be spending eternity. I feel like a victim. Victim? I'm, I'm, I'm a victim. He's a survivor. I'm a victim. He's a survivor. I'm a victim. He's a survivor. Victim? My mother could tell you a thing or two. The black eye, broken wrist, bloody face, all from the man who vows to love and cherish. But he wanted power and control. She found the courage to lead, to survive. She's, She's a survivor. She's a survivor. She's a survivor. But children all around the world, seared by violence, I still hear our scream. Let me tell you about screaming. I haven't slept for days. Outside of my house, all I can hear are the sound of helicopters, the smell of gas. People screaming, strangers cheering, occupy patriarchy, occupy capitalism, occupy our government, Wall Street, our religious institutions. Ask the police, but don't they have families? Peaceful revolution, decolonize, occupy. I straddle between the world of optimism and cynicism. I see our glaciers schools deteriorating, young men of color dying. And I think to myself, what a terrible world. On the side of optimism, I see educators, activists, students, artists, struggling to make it over that mountain of despair, oppression, of violence, of hate to create a whole new world of peace and justice. And I think 
Scary too, right? Very scary. <laughs> Can't trust anyone. Always gotta watch your back. There's that crazy girl over there. She's always acting weird. What's she doing? I don't know, I'm gonna find out. She's writing something. What is it? Five days till the end. It looks like a poem called Five Days Till the End. Right? What does that mean? Maybe we should tell somebody. Five days till the end. Five days till the end. Five days till the end? What does that mean? Never know who, never know when. I'm keeping my distance. Can't trust anyone. Always gotta watch your back. Never know who, never know when. I'm keeping my distance. Can't trust anyone. Always gotta watch your back. Never know who, never know when. Trust anyone. Always gotta watch your back. Dad! different. 
as far back as I can remember. I had love in my heart and lots of feelings, but I never knew how to show them on the outside. It's almost impossible for me to smile, laugh, hug, relax, or even make jokes when people are around. So they made fun of me, teased me, bullied me, and pushed me further inside myself. <clears throat> but then I got to high school, and I became a part of a small community of open and accepting people. They knew how to smile, laugh, hug, relax, and they made jokes all the time. So my senior year, when I was stripped of my dignity and my rights, these were the people who helped me begin to heal. Don't you know? Oh, 
Inhalation. Inspiration. Entwined with breeze. If I was a painter, I would recreate our cultural regression and relaunch a revolution. Maybe we can emerge from seclusion. Pop the bubble that keep us apart. Maybe we can reinvigorate our nation. Maybe we'll paint the world with our words. Yes, one more round of applause for our amazing
I don't know, it sounds hard to do it in three days, but it wasn't as hard as you think. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you can see where there could have been polish, you know, like as a performing arts director, like we could have spent, even if we had like two more days, like the, there's so much ambitious material, we could have polished it and, and it would have even flowed better. So there, this is so fun for teachers to be out of their comfort zone. <laughs> For me, anyway, I'm a teacher. Yes, and I just have one quick follow-up question among the participants in terms of why did you feel it was helpful to use personal stories as a way to convey human rights issues? I mean, what, what, how, how did that seem to work? Well, that's a good question. And um, for me, uh, if it's something that you feel within your heart, then it's best to express it. That versus talking from an abstract or a second personal story, it's always good that, and you know, it's a connection between the storyteller and the listener. So they, if they can hear your heart, no matter what the words are, then they can actually understand what you're saying. Yeah, Thank you. 